So is progressive Christianity Christianity at all? You see, countless numbers of traditional Christians are abandoning ship. If they're not leaving faith fully, they're moving over to a space that some call progressive Christianity. What do you have to believe to be a progressive Question. Christian? What is sin? What role does the old... Give me a scripture that supports that. Does it matter? Was Jesus a feminist? The Bible is not a divinely dictated book. Huh? I mean, you could see it all over TikTok, YouTube, Reels, what seems to be a new, fresh take on Christianity. But is it really? So to continue the metaphor of abandoning ship as people are abandoning the ship of traditional Christianity, which let's be honest, has many holes. They're leaving it for progressive Christianity, which has just as many holes or more than where they're coming from. But irregardless of where you find yourselves on the high seas of faith, stick with me for the next few moments and I'll show you how to ground your faith when it seems to be sinking on church door. My undergraduate Bible professor would beat it into us every single class. Oh, I mean, not literally beat it into us, but it was certainly emphasized. Definitions are extremely important. And in the case of the modern landscape of Christian faith, I would say they're more crucial than ever before. We live in a time when you say something as simple as truth, you've just opened up a Pandora's box of people's thoughts and opinions trying to explain what that truly means. So when it comes to progressive Christianity, we must ask, what does this really mean? But first, let me give you one note of caution. This is not meant to villainize people who might find themselves in this space. It is only to help us, as we all are in the pursuit of truth, to wrestle objectively with the reality of what Christian faith is. So if I could give you one word to keep as an overarching filter, that one word is charitability. Pitchforks! Can't be an angry mob without pitchforks! Rather than jumping to grab your pitchfork, can I encourage you to seek out a cup of coffee first, followed by an extended dose of conversation. Because truth be told, many people have found themselves in this space called progressive Christianity because of the result of hurt or abuse that they experienced in traditional Christian spaces. The old adage rings true. You catch more flies with honey than vinegar, so please keep charitability in mind. Now, progressive Christianity, what is it? Well, let's turn to the most reliable source that we have for anything on subjects like this, social media. That's cap. I, I accuse you of capping. This is Colby Martin, a self-proclaimed progressive Christian, explaining part of his understanding of what progressive Christianity is. Progressive Christianity, it's not a monolith. Uh, there is no official creed for progressive Christianity that demands acquiescence from its members. Actually, even saying members here is a bit of a misnomer because there is no membership. There's no set of governing rules or gatekeepers or requirements for how to talk or what to think. Because for me, to be a progressive Christian has meant that I opt out of a larger institution of organized religion that always seems to place more and more demands upon its adherents. So it's been this kind of antidote to the state oppressive, restrictive form of institutionalized Christianity. As I've experienced it, uh, progressive Christianity attempts to decentralize leadership, uh, to democratize the ministry of the gospel, and it seeks to restore a respect for diversity of belief under a large umbrella of faith. Now from this video, I think we can see a few crucial items that help us define progressive Christianity. First, it's broadly defined. Many people who say progressive Christian mean different things. Secondly, we see a rejection of traditional or orthodox belief like we see in institutionalized Christianity, which is like Protestantism or Catholicism. And thirdly, there is a diversity of beliefs. Therefore, they are much more accepting of what defines the line between who is Christian, who is not. Now, when you take that at face value, I totally see where people are drawn to this ideology. Why not just broaden the scope? From a PR perspective, it's really nice. More people in the kingdom seems great. But digging a little bit deeper, prominent progressive theologian Brandon Robertson in his conversation with apologist Sean McDowell said this, if items we learn contradict our faith, 
speaking of science, history, or reason, we should be open to rethinking and reforming our beliefs. In other words, if our modern understandings contradict scripture, we should reject the scripture and reform our belief. Now, in my opinion, this is dangerous. If the Bible is now a free for all when it comes to interpretation, there is no foundation, no common understanding that we can share together. That's why I'm calling today's message, how to ground your faith when it seems to be sinking. In my estimation, this is the biggest hurdle that exists for the progressive Christian. If everything is up to interpretation, how is there any ground for us to confidently stand together on any matter of faith? As Alexander Hamilton said, Those who stand for nothing, fall for anything. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul is speaking to Timothy, a young minister in the early church. And in this letter, he's warning him of people who oppose truth. And in the context of this chapter, he is speaking specifically of scriptural truth. Paul paints these opposers like this. In verse 5, these are people who have an appearance of godliness, but deny the power thereof. And in verse 7, they're always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Sound somewhat familiar? I think so. So what is the antidote? What is Paul's advice to Timothy when it comes to establishing solid ground for our faith to stand on? Well, he says this, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with these sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture, is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So Paul's advice for grounding our faith is this, we must have a firm belief in God's word. You might say it like this, scripture must be our authority. It's the thing that grounds us. It gives us a foundation in which we can thrive together. Now, many who are in progressive circles might say, who defines scripture then? And how is it interpreted as authority? I think Francis Chan did a great job giving his thoughts on this idea recently saying this. There was one council of leaders and what did One they? authority. Yeah, and they all looked at this book, studied it together and came up with, this is our best understanding and everyone came under it. And so to believe that a thousand years later, when all those guys and their collective wisdom and all those people that were so close to the time of Jesus and his teaching, they're all off because, you know, I went to seminary mm. and I got the, the highest brand of Bible software and I was in my office for years, you know, studying this and I've got it. There's an arrogance to that. We as traditional Christians are part of a lineage that has affirmed these scriptures for centuries. The 66 books we call the Bible are not just fly-by-night inspirational words, but divine writings that Christians have built their lives around for over 2,000 years. And like Francis said, who are we to think that now in this generation we have outsmarted the ones whom were standing on their shoulders? Paul's advice to Timothy was to lean into what had been passed on to him as truth, not to just throw it away. <laughs> and why? Because these scriptures are from God. They're not just human philosophies. They are divinely directed words that have power. Power, as the scripture says, makes us righteous or right and equips us for every good work. If we can submit ourselves under it fully, not just cherry picking verses or pulling verses out of context to support a specific ideology, it can give us the mutual ground that we need to strive forward together. And listen, there is a big difference between having a fascination with Jesus and actually following Jesus. The Jesus who is revealed to us in scripture saying that he is the way, the truth, the life and no one comes to the Father except through Him. The question for you is, who will you choose to be a follower of? The Jesus of the Bible or the Jesus who is perpetually reinterpreted by the winds of prevailing thought? If you want to know the personal, 
Jesus of Scripture that says He is the way, the truth, and the life. We have a team of people here today that want to show you who He is. You can text prayer to the number you see coming up on the screen or reach us down in the chat. We would love to talk with you today. Help support great Christian content by hitting that subscribe button and the notification bell so that every single time we put out a piece of content, comes directly to you. Or you can go the extra mile by going to rivervalleyrockford.org slash give and making a donation there. Every single cent that comes in goes right back out to help people just like you take their next step with Jesus. We're so glad that you've come to be with us here today and our prayer for you is that you would discover the true Jesus of scripture. And as you've discovered him, you would follow him with all that you are. Hey, we post a video on this channel every single week. Here's one more video we think will encourage you today.